somebody shout hallelujah. I believe that the challenge Christians have is the patience to wait for God to manifest what he has said. And it's not just we have challenges with patience, then we mess things up by what we say, what we do, uh, by impatience. Some of us begin to, to reverse what God wants to do in our lives. I wrote something early this morning in my note. I was meditating on the word of God and I was writing this for the first time. There is no prayer that can overturn what you have negatively confessed in your mouth. This is why the Bible says, for we have need of patience. There is no prayer. Prayer will not overturn what you have negatively invited into your life of what you are shut out of your life. When God says it, he has done it. God's integrity is not questionable like you and I. We can change our mind. The Bible says the gift and the calling of God is without repentance. If he has released it, it is done. So the challenge is not always on God's part. It's our ability to wait and receive with faith. Anything God has said, the truth is that you don't need to remind him. You only need to comply by faith. You don't need to tell him because the moment he says it, it goes into effect waiting for your cooperation by faith. And I pray this morning that whatever God has said concerning you shall come to pass. Everything God has said about your life will come to pass in the name of Jesus. Whatever he has said about your life will come to pass in the name of Jesus. Let me say, for we have need of patience. We have need, so not just waiting. Now, don't mistake long time of waiting for waiting in faith. Because if all you do is you complain, you undo, you say negative things, you say things that are not like faith. Now, it's not the same thing. It's not the way God is talking about. Now, the weight that deliver is the weight that you wait in faith. When everything you are saying is agreeing with what you are praying and what God, you want God to do in your life. My prayer is that this morning, your faith will move to another level. In the precious name of Jesus. Somebody shout, my faith will move to another level. My faith will move to the next level. My faith will go higher. In the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, let's put our hands together for the Lord. I want to welcome us this morning in Jesus' mighty name. Whether you are on site or off site, you are welcome in Jesus' name. I want you to expect the power of God to touch you. I want you to expect not to go out of this service the same way that you came. In the name of Jesus, because expectation brings direct God's power in your life. That will be your testimony Amen. in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Spirit of the living God, I thank you this morning for your faithfulness. I thank you for the life of your sons and daughters. Father, we have come to receive, we have come to be blessed. Father, anoint your word, anoint my mouth, anoint my mind in the precious name of Jesus. Prepare the heart of your people to receive. Lord, let every stubbornness of heart, every spiritual stubbornness, every spirit of the last day that misinterpret the word of God, that make people hear what, different from what is being said, let it be destroyed in the name of Jesus. Let the intent of your word be delivered. Let it be fulfilled in the name of Jesus. Cause this service to be, bring glory to your name. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's put our hands together for the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. You are welcome in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We may be seated before we get into the word. I have two certificates for two of our children that have gone through the discipleship and membership class. I would like to call them forward as quickly as they can. I have my Oyedele. Wow. Let's put our hands together for the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Put a photographer, take their picture, please. 
Hallelujah. Congratulations, Mayowa. Great job. Thank you. The Lord bless you. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Okay, come on. Go. Are you taking it? Yes. No, both of them. One is a discipleship class. What is a membership class? The Lord bless you. Congratulations. We have Daniel Ogundele. Daniel, where are you? Come forward. Hallelujah. Come on, let's put our hands together for the Lord for these folks. It took them uh, about seven weeks. Some of them didn't graduate. Please, those of you that you have makeup classes, please go back and do it. I need you to do those classes. Is that all right? If you have makeup class, come closer. Take us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Congratulations. And those of you that you have taken your certificate before we started taking pictures, you can find a way to come back. We can, we can do it during the week. <laughs> Hallelujah. We are going to get into the word of the Lord. I want to say something to us that the Lord is in my heart. All of you know how uh, my friend, Pastor Glenn Arekion, uh, we thank God for his life. Uh, this morning we're going to give God glory for, his, for what God has done in his life. Uh, also, I'm going to say this. Pastor Glenn went to Florida and he caught COVID. Spent weeks in the hospital and ended up in coma. But we give God all the glory because he came out of coma hey. three days ago. Hey. Uh, the last two weeks has been a little bit tough. But we thank God because against every medical verdict, against every medical verdict, against every medical professionalism, against the verdict of science. So let's rise to our feet and let's give God all the glory. Let's give him all the glory, all the worship. Let's give him all the glory. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for bringing your son back to life. Thank you, Jesus. So you be all the glory. We owe it all to you. In Jesus' mighty name. In case you don't know Pastor Glenn, you might want to go online and see some of his messages here. You can't know him and don't love him. That is the truth. And you will wonder why things like that happen, but it happen. But we thank God because he's back at home now. Uh, we spoke last night. We've spoken twice since he's been out. Uh, you know, Pastor Glenn, he's still going to joke about it when it comes there. <laughs> he's still going to joke about it. So, but we thank God for what God has done. Now, the Lord laid something in my heart, aside from my, your whole friend. We're going to send some seed to him. He didn't ask for it. He never asked for it. But the Lord laid on my heart that we'll take some seed. Please, something good. As much as you send, you give, we're going to send to him. No, I'm not looking for tips. Just, and I have my reason. Not because he's in need. He's not in need. I have a reason. The Holy Spirit give me a reason why we have to do this. Secondly, please, let's be conscious of uh, our safety in terms of all these things. This is simple uh, science. I know you have faith. I have faith too. I've never caught COVID. I can never catch it. But we all may not be at the same level of faith. You have to say, let he that stand take heed. Stand, uh, take heed lest he pause. Uh, we thank God for the life of that man of God is an apostle of faith as you know so when somebody racks up over half a million miles every year to go preach the gospel you, you know what, what I'm talking about yearly so but he went for an event in Florida and uh, you and I know what is going on in Florida right now it's a reality it's not fake in the news it's true he, and two days or a day after was hospitalized, and before you know it, it became something else. So please, let's take all these necessary precautions. Wear your mask when it is needed. If you go out, wear your mask. 
You are around people, don't let them breathe into your nose. Don't let people speak into your nose. And also, don't get too close to people. There are some people here that have seen that uh, you want to talk to me, your mouth has to be in my mouth. Don't do it. <laughs> I'm saying it publicly because I don't want to embarrass anybody. <laughs> so it's just common decency. So maintain some distance, please. So I'm fine. That's the truth. I can never catch COVID. Ever. It's not going to happen. So, but at the same time, letting you know some things, when this thing is close to home, we thank God because God brought Pastor Glenn back to life. If it had happened on the other side, that week we won't have normal service here. That's the truth. Because number one, I would have had to fl fly there. I'm going to find a way to go see him soon, but that's what it is. So, but we give God all the glory because he's back at home. Let's take our seat. Are you ready to be blessed this morning? Yes. Hallelujah. The Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of the Lord. The more you hear the word of faith, the more you grow in faith. Listen to this. You never whine or complain that you don't have faith because it is available. Is somebody hearing me? Faith is available to the limit that you want. Faith can be groomed, grown, and acquired. Let me say, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of the Lord. Some of us can say, well, I don't have faith like pastor. I don't have faith like that kind of person. Stop saying that. Stop acquiring it. Stop saying, I don't have faith like somebody. Even that time you are spending to say it, it's a time you can invest in acquiring faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of the Lord. If you say, I don't have faith like this, I don't have faith, I think it's hypocrisy because you can go get faith. It's like you don't have food at home, but there is grocery next door. You, are, you just go get it. Don't say, I don't have food at home. Don't go, go get it. So faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing the word of the Lord. Your faith level will define and determine your Christian experience in life. So it is not what the devil wants. It is not how you were born or some things in your life that you can control. As long as you are able to grow in faith, you can control everything around your destiny. Glory be to the name of the Lord. So whether you are under the sound of my voice, in-house or online this morning, I want us to push forward what we have started doing the last couple of weeks. The message of faith or the revelation of faith is inexhaustible. So you can't finish it. Now, some of the things I'm saying in the course of this series some of them I'm also encountering them for the first time myself. When I study the Bible, I stand meditating the word of God. Then revelation begins to come. Some of them I'm also encountering them by myself. Last week, two weeks, not yet. I didn't have them. So I found out that the revelation of faith is inexhaustible. So what that simply means is that you can never get to a point where you feel graduated from the school of faith. You only stop when you think you are done with exploits. You only stop when you think you are done with breakthroughs. As long as you desire more breakthroughs in your life, you need more exploits in your life, you need God to do things, to answer some prayers in your life, you never stop from the school of faith. Don't let people deceive you by praising you for how long you have been, you have, you know, you know, let me tell you something. I've had people say, oh, a pastor has faith and all these kinds of things. But I said under my voice, I said these people are deceiving themselves. I said, they trust this is a pastor too much. I will tell myself, I said, if I have faith, why, I've, I've not moved any mountain yet. Anytime people say that, that's how I feel. If I have the kind of faith you guys are talking about, I walk to Wano Creek Kaiser or any Kaiser, 
and, and discharge everybody that is there. So we will continue to grow in faith. When people praise, don't praise yourself, please. Don't deceive yourself. The revelation and the knowledge of God is inexhaustible. You will only try your own and go when it comes back for you. It's inexhaustible. And if you are not ready to stop in exploit, don't stop registering at the school of faith. So don't say, oh, it's faith again. We've had enough. You have just found somebody that doesn't know anything about God. Don't ever stop. Because the deeper you go in the revelation of God and faith, the more you now realize there is more depth for you to cover. So no one can finish. No one can complete the revelation of faith. Because God is so deep. Romans chapter 11 and verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. It's unsearch it has an unsearchable depth. You can't find it out. You can only stop when you are tired. The knowledge of God and the knowledge of God's word and faith has a bottomless pit, bottomless depth. It doesn't end. Because no one can finish the discovery or revelation of faith. You can only go as far as you can search. And because your experience in life is going to be determined by your level of faith, now it's good to get greedy and keep going in the depth, in the faith of God's word. It's advisable to keep digging deeper, this revelation of faith. Because in the hand, it is going to be to everyone according to their faith. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 29. According to your faith, let it be unto you. So that nobody is going to blame God. It's according to your faith. It's going to be to everyone according to their faith. So natural and spiritual wisdom now requires that we keep stretching ourselves in faith. So that we can continue to enlarge our territory. You keep stretching. You keep stretching. Now, if your stretches five years ago is what you are still stretching now, your story can't change. That sounds negative, but that is the truth. If your level of obedience, if your if you are if your stretch has been constant, everything will be constant. Is how much you stretch. Because faith is about stretching. How much you stretch, that's what determines new things in each one's life. So that's why it's never wisdom for a Christian to say, I have done my best. You've done your best five years ago. Because you said you have done your best, you don't think there is more to do. No, it's all about stretches. Faith is all about stretches. Beyond your ability. There is nothing about faith that is within anyone's ability. Every testimony of faith is a testimony of people going outside of their natural ability. Every testimony of faith. If it is based on your ability, you will never live a lifestyle of faith. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 from verse 13, 2 Corinthians 10, 13, and 14. But we will not boast of things without our measure, without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God has distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. Verse 40 says, For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, so as though we preach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. 
Faith is all about stretching. If, all, if you don't want to stretch, forget about testimony of faith. If you are not ready to stretch, if you want to stay within your comfort zone, your safety zone, your comfortability zone, I'm not comfortable as doing that much. I'm not comfortable as go, taking that much risk. That's not my level. It's your level, this kind of people. You remain at the same spot. You remain at the same spot. It's all about stretches. I've never encountered this before in my life in scripture, this revelation of stretch. Going beyond your limit. That's why the Bible says every step of faith is a walk. If you are not ready to stretch, which is the work required, you are not ready for the new thing. Every testimony of faith is a testimony that stretch people. That is by working now God's wisdom. In Hebrews, the title of this message is the profession of our faith or the profession of faith. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. He said, for he is faithful that promise. This morning I want to show us from God's word. All of us quote it. All of us say it. We serve the faithful God. Is that right? We say, oh, God is faithful. Is that right? Oh, we know that God is faithful. Is that okay? Is that not what we know? But the Bible says, let us hold fast the work of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful, the promise. So what that means is that your work of faith, your profession of faith, will precede his faithfulness. Yes, he's faithful, but it's your work of faith that ushers in his faithfulness. So many of us, we are waiting for God to show his faithfulness, but God is waiting for your work of faith. Let's read that scripture together, all of us. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. Let's read loud that want to go. Now, that word profession, I want to replace it with another word, another synonym. It's up to you. You, any word you use, it doesn't matter. Whatever you think profession means, I want to simplify it. We're going to read it again. You just want to change that word profession. Let's read. Want to go. What do you call it? The job of our faith. I mean, I call it job. So it's serious. It's a job. Let us all fast the job, the work, the assignment of our faith. Not just holding on to it without wavering. Then for he is faithful, the promise. What I mean is that forget about his side. He is faithful, he's secured, is on you and I. God will not be more faithful to anyone than the work of faith, the job of faith that you did. For he is faithful. So it is our job first, then is faithfulness next. So to shout it, God is faithful. I trust God is faithful. It doesn't bring his faithfulness. What does faithfulness of God mean? It means God show up at your point of helplessness. That means he never allow you to get stranded. That's a commitment on God's part. But God needs a commitment from your part. And Hebrews 10, the King, New King James calls it, let us offer the confession of our faith. The confession of our hope of faith. 
In other words, you are saying it. So your confession of the word is job. So it is not to say it when we say it in church. It is to live by it. Never let anything negative proceed from your mouth. Now, the summary of our expectation in God can be described as God's faithfulness. That's God coming through for us when we mostly need him at the point of strandedness or God's intervention at the state of helplessness. So you do the work first, then God manifests his faithfulness next. You do the work first, that is where people that has analytical minds, they have problems. Or people that call it risk, what if I do the work and it doesn't, no, you don't play that game with God. You do the work first, then you see his faithfulness next. And that work is how much you stretch in faith. That is not walking by sight or not speaking from your feelings. Speaking what the word of God says is the foundation of our faith. Speaking what God's word says is the foundation of our faith. I said, for we walk by faith, not by sight. What does that mean? We walk by the revelation of God's word. Or we walk by, we live by what we discover from God's word against how we feel. So you trust, you put your life on what you read in the pages of Bible over how you feel. So you trust what God says over what you read in your account. You trust what God was says over your medical report. For we walk by faith or we live by faith, not by sight. Sight means everything from the realms of the senses. What to smell, touch, feel, you were told, what you heard. Anything from that senses can capture. But we say we don't live like those things, by those things. We live by what God's word says. Now, you are not moving by emotions and feelings. You know emotion can destroy. Let me repeat it again. Your feelings, your emotions are not reliable. And they are not dependable. So you never live by them. Now, uh, some of us here, uh, maybe pretty much all of us, must have done some things that later we told ourselves, I disappointed myself, I should not have done that. Is that all right? How many of us have gone through situations and say, I'm not proud of what I did? How many of us? The Lord bless you all. So now, but as at the time you were doing it or we were doing it, was how you felt. How you felt, that is responding to feelings. So why will you live your life based on emotions that is not dependable that you can come back down the road and find out you just made a mistake? But the word of God is constant. It never changes. It's been proven, tested through fire seven times. Will never fail. You are going to live your life as a roller coaster if you walk by feelings. I guess that's what fuel people when they call somebody is wishy washy. Somebody is unstable. Why? Emotions, you can be happy today and be unhappy in the afternoon. And the evening, you can become happy again. You can sleep happy in the, in the night, very happy. You just woke up the next day. You feel like dying on the bed. You feel like you don't want to see today. Emotions. But the Bible told us, for we walk by faith, so you are never not supposed to live by those things. Emotions lead you to do things that you may regret for the rest of your life or you regret for a long time. 
So you never walk by feelings. You live by God's word. Living by God's word is you are ignoring everything that senses are telling you. Everything, you live contrary to verdict and report. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful. So there is power, so when you live by God's word, you are living by power. And the word of God is undoubtedly the most powerful force in this world. Because nothing resists the power of God. Hebrews 1 and from verse 1, God who at various times, in various ways, spoke to all, to, spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Verse 2, as in this last day spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed here of all things, through whom also he made the words, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Everything he upholds by the word of his power. So that's more reliable because everything answers to that. He upholds everything by the words of his power. Yes, I know that's how you feel, but I'm telling you, your feeling is not dependable. Substitute your dependence on how you feel and depend on God's word. That's how to live by faith. Please, you know what maturity is? Ability to comport yourself when there is tension. Is that not what old age means, sir? <laughs> Have you not seen situations where you see somebody blowing up? You just say it's not necessary, just relax. But that person can't see it. That's what maturity is all about. So, what that means is this. How you are feeling that you are boiling is not reliable. You will regret that and you are doing. So, many years ago, some kids came to our church. They visited from, for some event. I don't know whether they broke our chairs or something. <laughs> God, I'm messing with you, Pastor Christy. Now, <laughs> I remember now. They broke our seat or something. And when they told me, I got mad. I said, I was going to call them. But I said, I should not call them, I should leave them. I called them. Well, they turned it over my head. <laughs> At the end of it all, it was as if I was the one that broke the chair. <laughs> and I will never forget. And I asked myself, why didn't I listen to her? Why did I even call over chairs? But I got mad at that these kids, they were grown up, older than our kids at that point, and they did some other things. But I just got mad because they broke our chairs. So, and I mentioned it when I had, I remember Pastor Chris said to me, he said, don't call them, just forget about it. I said, I had. The moment she left my office, I called the parents. They turned it on my head. But that's how I felt. If you are going to live the lifestyle of faith, you have to suppress your feelings. Otherwise, it will mislead you. If you are going to live the life that involves God, you will have to suppress and overcome your emotions. It will otherwise lead you in the wrong direction. Bible says, is upholding all things by the word of his power, including our lives. But that power in God's word is standing still until you provoke it by confession or by action. You know, one of the, I'm sure you're going to hear this testimony when Pastor Glenn is coming here. Let me tell you what was going on. Read, I'm going to read these two read scriptures. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. He said, before he entered into coma, this was it was plain all over. He said it was plain around the clock. He spent two weeks at the hospital. 
Round the claw, can I quote plant messages and purpose messages? Then he was quoting the scripture, if the spirit of him who raised... Now, when somebody is still alive, they are quoting scriptures. You can't quote scripture when you are in coma. Now, the second scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 9. Yes, we had a sentence of death in ourselves. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Who deliver us from a great death. And they were playing this thing, play this thing, until he jacked up. After two days in coma. The dead hears the voice of God. Every situation hears God's voice. Your health hears God's voice. Your body hears the voice of God. Your finances hears the voice of God. The challenge is that you are not speaking God. You are speaking what the devil wants you to say. He said, they played this step, they kept it rolling. They kept it rolling. They kept it rolling. And the doctors didn't know what to do again. Nothing medically was possible. All of a sudden, he opened his eyes. Because the dead hears God's voice. Oh my God. In the precious name of Jesus, everything called dead in your life we hear the sound of God this morning in the name of Jesus. Your body is hearing God. Your organs are hearing God. Your productive organ is hearing God. In the name of Jesus, everything hears the maker. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody rise to your feet and begin to speak God's word. Over every situation of your life, you declare my mind, hear the voice of the Lord. I have no spirit of fear. I don't have the spirit of fear. I have power and I have a sound mind. My body is my organs. Begin to touch your body. Begin to speak God's word over your finances, over your situation. Everything hears the voice of God. Speak, the, speak God into your bodies. Speak him into your bodies. Speak God into your bodies. Speak God into your bodies. Speak God into the fibroids. Speak him into the bleedings. The irregular bleeding. Speak God's word into it. Everything hears God's voice. Everything hears the voice of the Lord. In Jesus mighty name. We take your seat. Listen. Satan is the instigator of negative confession and doubt so that he can effectively stop you from speaking God's word. It's one thing when somebody is still conscious you are confessing of scriptures, but nobody in coma confesses nothing. But the tapes keep playing. The messages keep playing. Kept playing, kept playing, kept playing, kept playing. How many times have you unleashed the revelation of God's word into your circumstance? Are you not saying the things, the verdict, the doctors and people are telling you? They say it's not possible. If you look at my credit report, you can't even buy a cell phone. Hallelujah. Let me give us, if you are going to have breakthrough by faith, let me give us two golden rules or some golden rules this morning. Number one, guard your mind and your mouth. Guard your mind. If you don't guard your mind, your mouth will leak what is in your mouth, in mind. If you don't protect your mind, your mouth will leak what is in your mind. So number one golden rule in the school of faith, guard your mind. Also, let me add this. 
what comes out of your mouth is as powerful as what you said in your heart. So, guard your mind. You can't have negative things in your mind and confess positive things. I guess that is where many of us have challenges. That's why when you are faced with a situation, you are not blaming yourself for not saying the right thing. Because the right thing was not in your spirit in the first place. Guard your mind. Guard your mouth. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34. Brother of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance they have, uh, abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Your mouth will always say what is in your heart. In your, in your heart. So don't wait when you are challenged. That is why you keep eating God's word every week. It will come out naturally when it's needed. It will naturally come out. So, this is what it is. Don't limit your hearing God's word when you are in church. It is not enough. You are going to be spiritually malnourished. You only come to church twice a week. Right? Now, if you feed twice a week, imagine how you are going to look over a period of one year. So, twice a week is never enough to sustain your spiritual vitality. Guard your mind. So, you don't study the word of God because you want to preach as a pastor. You study because you are eating it. You are feeding your spirit. You are feeding your spirit. You are feeding your spirit. Guard your mind. Guard your mouth. It says, for out of the abundance of heart, the mouth speaks. You will never say positive things if negative is in your heart. You don't need to agree. If I see you making negative confessions, I know the state of your heart. I know how you are thinking. Forget about speaking in tongues. That's not a test of faith. You will only say what is in your heart. Now, your heart is your spirit because you are a spirit. You have a soul, you live in a physical body. So, you feed your spirit regularly with God's word so that your mind, emotions, we have something to take from when it's challenged. Every negative confession that people say, either secretly or say to yourself, shows how empty and how shallow you are with God's word. Because you will say what is in your heart. If somebody gives you a negative verdict, you agree with it, it's because there is nothing positive in your spirit to neutralize it. If you have the word in your spirit, every negative confession, every negative that happens will sting you. It will be difficult for you to come out of your mouth. There are some negative things that it can never come out of my mouth, ever. Whether I'm sleeping or I'm not sleeping, my spirit will resist it. I was on the plane one time, this many years ago, and the, 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 the foolish pilot now announced, that uh, this is going to be serious. You know, when the, the, I thought they trained them that even if it's going to be serious, you don't say that. He just said, uh, he said all kinds of things that we should already, he said we're going to run into some ship that will feel like lifting the plane. <laughs> and a pastor friend of mine was with me. We were sat together, we sat together, Pastor King. He said, why did he say it? Why did he say it? <laughs> so why did he, he didn't have to say it? No, he said it before we take off. Now, when we run into the shift, he looked at me and said, why did he say it? I started, smile, I started smiling. He said, you are not human. I said, I'm not supposed to be. <laughs> he said, everybody was agitated. I mean, this thing were lifting people. I just felt like this. So when I realized that people were in serious problem, I deliberately started smiling. 
I deliberately started smiling. Then my friend said to me, what's wrong with you? Can't you see this thing? I said, have you been on a roller coaster before? I said, I do a lot of roller coaster in Disney. So that's why it feels good. <laughs> Pastor King, you know what he said? He said, I would never talk to you again. <laughs> Church, if the word is already in you, it is natural for it to come out, to come out when you are challenged. It is natural. You know why it doesn't come out? There is nothing there. There is nothing there. I have never considered or thought or have anything to do with who is in the White House, who is in Wall Street. That's their own. Why? Titan. Titan overrules any kind of economy plan by any government. It will rebook the devourer. So whether they do it well, they don't do it well. My money is secured. I'm under open heavens. And they can't stop open heaven because they know where that one is. Church, please. This thing works. You know, I was talking to the president of Seneca recently. We've been having some meetings recently. He asked me, he said, Pastor Isaac, he said, what did you do that made us turn over the building to I said, you didn't turn it over, we bought it. <laughs> because he came and asked me, he said, can you give us a long lease, like five years and above? He said, why did we sell it? I said, because we need it. <laughs> I said, you remember the $60,000 you took from us? <laughs> he said, oh, I should not have, we should not have even done that. If I know we're going to be friends. I said, it was good. Because we get it back with interest. <laughs> Nothing more dependable than covenant practices. Nothing more dependable. At the point of losing 60,000, I went with, with him, Moji. I said, let's write off 60,000 for them. If we get this building, $60,000 is nothing. I said, I don't lose money. We don't lose money. Titans don't lose money. Amen. But we sent $60,000 away without knowing when it will come back. But I said, Titans don't lose money. Titans don't lose money. And six months after, they gave us 70000 for a space they didn't need. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And I'll pour you out a blessing that you will not have enough room. Me and we are very good now. We are very good friends. <laughs> we are very, very good friends. He said, you're going to teach me that thing you call covenant. I said, you teach me your business. <laughs> Nothing is more dependable than God's word. Hallelujah. Guard your mind. In Luke chapter 21 and verse 19, it says, by your patience, possess your souls. In other words, subject your soul to your control. Don't let your soul control you. You will regret it. Don't let your emotions, and when people want to get at you, they work on your emotions. They, they work on your feelings. And the all suspected Christian started acting. Because somebody has programmed you. You have to say, by your patience, possess your soul. Possess. Be in control of your emotions. And when you do, Psalms 39 and verse 1, I said, I will guard my ways, lest I sin with my song. So, everything you say that's according to scripture is a sin. 
lest I sin with my thong. With my thong. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle. He said, why the wicked are before me? What, are, what does that mean? When I have opportunity to say something contrary, I will not. Number two, golden rule. Church, listen. These rules, you can't escape them. Guard your mind, guard your mouth. Number two is a must in the school of faith. Let no circumstance make you say anything negative. Never make negative confession. If it is negative, don't say it. I, I've shared this before. Many years ago, many, many years ago, we go to buy a house in Tracy. And I've seen three houses. I've seen three houses. No. So the third one was the best one. The moment I saw the house, I said, this is the one, this one, this one. But we went in through a back street. When we were going out, we had, the nurse said, they said, oh, this is the main entrance to this house. As we got on the main street, I saw crossroad street. So I became troubled in my spirit. I said, is this the exit? They said, it's your traffic light. They said, what happened? I said, crossroad. The agent looked at me. He said, what's going on? I said, I can't buy this house. I can't live on the, I'll be telling people, when I'm giving you this money for my house, I'll say, you turn on crossroad, crossroad, crossroad. I said, I don't want it. He said, but what has that got to do? I said, crossroad is negative. <laughs> I said, where's your house? On your left, when you get to crossroad, you turn. You are in my house, crossroad, crossroad. You can think I'm crazy. I didn't buy it. It wasn't the best. It was the best one. I didn't buy it. I can't imagine me associating my life with Crossroad. That's how insane I've been in the school of faith. And this was 2005. So we have been on this journey for some time too. <laughs> this was 2005. I cannot imagine associating my life my address with crossroad. Now, it's not my street address. It's just the main traffic light will turn. I said, no, I don't want it. Stop saying something negative, anything negative, if you don't want it. Stop talking about death if you don't want to die. Stop talking about sickness if you don't want to be sick. Now, I'm not saying you won't have opportunity to say it. Avoid it. Let the doctors know what you believe. For, for them to do their job, maybe they are recording them. Let them say everything they are saying. When they are saying their own, then you say your own. Never make any negative confession. The only time you had our finances as a church is when I share like this, when I'm sharing testimony. Have we ever had any meeting saying we are broke, we don't have to find more money? Has that ever happened? Not one time. We have never had a meeting trying to tie down money. If it is not there, what's the principle? We don't need it yet. At the point of needing it, God will supply Don't let anybody put you in a position where you are going to say, I don't have it. Do you know that you can't even say food is finished in your house? You must move to the next level this morning. You can't even say it is finished. You can't even say, I don't have it. There is nothing God has done that is not enough. Don't say anything negative ever. Golden rule. Don't forget, unspoken negative word is just as dangerous on the spoken one. Emotion feels from what you see and feel. 
which goes against the provision of redemption. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What does that mean? The purpose of his death and resurrection is to give us hope in all situations. So, a Christian can never be in an hopeless situation. Now, listen, I'm not saying you won't feel hopeless. But you are, not hopeless, you are only hopeless because you fail to see hope. The purpose of his death and resurrection is to prepare hope in every situation. And he prepared it in advance before you and I were born. So, hope is there. You only have not found it. Let's read that scripture together. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. All of us. Let's read. One to go. He has begotten us again to a living hope. So no born again believer is really hopeless anywhere. No matter the circumstance, you only fail to see it. So, you know, I was meditating this morning. I wrote something in my note, which is interesting. I said, redemption is an advanced parole of escape. From Jesus Christ to every Christian. He has bonded you out of problem already. It's a spiritual parole. That he gave in advance. That you are going to likely get into this trouble. But I parole you before you were born. So how do you take it? By walking in faith. Those who said they can't make it to the promised land didn't make it. That's why your prayer can never overturn your negative comments. I know that's how you feel. But as a Christian, that's not what to say. Can you imagine some people march for 40 years in the wilderness? The only thing that disqualified them, they said we can't make it. There are giants in the land. And God said, what I had them say is what I will make happen for them. And I said, Joshua and Caleb, with a different spirit, just for saying we can make it, just by saying we are able, they made it. The profession of our faith. So never make negative confessions. Never confess doubts. Now, I did not say you will not have doubts, but I'm saying don't say it. Doubt confessed is doubt possessed. Doubt confessed is doubt possessed. Stop being negative. It destroys life. Stop being negative. Be positive in no situations. Never confess your doubts. Doubt confessed is doubt possessed. Because you will have whatever you say. Now, everyone is subject to doubt. Everybody. Because Satan exists. Satan will sow seed to make you doubt yourself. He went to Jesus and talked to Jesus after he finished fasting for 40 days. The purpose is to get you disconnected from the world. You now focus on your doubt, on your feelings. You find out that at the begin when you begin with doubt, you will end with frustrations. So never confess your feelings, never confess doubt. Doubt in itself is not powerful. 
until you do something with it. Doubt itself has no power. Doubt itself has no power until you live by it. Hallelujah. Let's bring this to a close. In Matthew chapter 14 and verse 25 to 32. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out of fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is high. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water and go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And because he was afraid, because he's not listening to his feelings or what he sees, he's looking at the wind. The Bible says he began to sink. He would not have been sinking if he didn't if he'd never looked at the wind. He already walked on the water. Now he now says, and immediately Jesus stretched out to his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you are little faith. Why did you doubt? <laughs> so the problem was that the moment he looked at the wind, he said, What if I sink? Then he started sinking. He just said, Why did you doubt? So the problem was the doubting. Why did you doubt? That's how Satan sows seed of doubt to people. What if I end up like this? What if I end up a failure? What if I don't make it? What if I end up being a loser? What if you end up being a winner? Rise to your feet. Jesus said, why did you doubt? I want you to ask God in prayer. In every way that the Lord has ministered to you this morning, I want to ask God in prayer. Holy Spirit, empower me in the school of faith. Empower me in the school of faith. Open your mouth and ask the Lord in prayer. Destroy the spirit of doubt. Destroy every spirit of home belief. Put a lock in my mouth. Let my mouth only comply with your word. Open your mouth and ask the Lord in prayer. Open your mouth and ask God in prayer. Boost my faith, Lord. Boost my faith, Lord. Boost my faith, Lord. I receive fresh baptism of faith. In Jesus' mighty name. Receive grace this morning for next level of faith in the name of Jesus. Receive the grace to accept the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus. I rebuke every spirit of Pharisees and the Sadducees. Every spirit of teacher of the law. I rebuke that spirit. I subject them to the authority of the Holy Scripture in your life. In the name of Jesus. So shall it be. In Jesus' mighty name. If you have prayed, if you have joined us for service this morning and you have never given your life to Jesus, you have an opportunity right now to, to Accept Lord Jesus into your life. If you have never confessed him as Lord of your, and your Savior, you are not born again. I'm going to lead you in this simple prayer. Either you are in house or you are online. Join me to pray this prayer if you fall into that category. Lord Jesus, I know that you are the Son of God. You died on the cross of Calvary. You gave your life to save my life. The Bible says, if I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, I will be saved. I declare this morning that you are the Lord of my life. Write my name in the book of life. I am born again in Jesus' precious name. If I pray that prayer, 
I want to send a text, yes, Jesus, or an email, yes, Jesus, to the phone number or the email on your screen. Yes, Jesus, one word. We'll be able to follow up with you. And my prayer is that the power of God that has brought you and made you pray this prayer will keep you, preserve you, and establish you in Jesus' mighty name. And church is now open. Our addresses and contact on your screen. Please come and join us for service. I look forward to seeing you. The Lord bless you richly. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, let's put our hands together for the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. We may be seated. It is time for us to worship God with our offerings and our tithe this morning. Your offering is your own saying, Father, I thank you. So your offering should give honor to God. It should reflect honor. Your offering is not the money you don't want. It's not a tip. It is the value you place on God's grace on your life. Let's worship God with our offerings and our tithe this morning. Your tithe is the 10% of every income. It is a Bible thing for us to do. So you tithe your offering. You, you tend to give at dominionlife.org on, on, on Zell or text to give. Just text the word give to this number, 925-275-1600, and you follow the prompting. It is the right thing to do. It is God's avenue. It is what God needs from you as a step of faith to be able to meet you in your finances. So let us worship God with our offerings and tithe this money. Let's go ahead and package our offerings and tithe. Glory be to the name of the Lord. Go ahead and process it and package it.